Hello, welcome and thank you for watching this webinar hosted by The Forge. I am Yvonne Phyllis, the Core Director of Operations at The Forge, and I'm here to formally welcome our guests for this particular discussion. They are um, our facilitator, Akani Shimange, and our three panelists, Dr. Kobani Kambela, Dr. B. Kaminga, and Tabiso Furukan Mohare. This webinar is the third on our topic, Patriarchal Violence, a Systemic War on Our Bodies. This particular discussion focuses on masculinities, or in particular, toxic masculinities. I will read the bios of our three panelists, and before proceeding with the discussion, Agani will introduce themselves. I'll start with the bio of Dr. B. Kaminga, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the African Center for Migration and Society at Wurz University, South Africa. They are the co-convener of the African LGBTQI plus Migration Research Network. The first book, Transgender Refugees and the Immersion in South Africa, was awarded the 2019 Sylvia Rivera Award in Transgender Studies. Their current book projects include Beyond the Mountain, Queer Life in Africa's Gay Capital, co-edited with Dr. Zeto Matebeni, which explores the conflicting iterations of race, sex, gender, and sexuality that mark Cape Town, and the first collection of African LGBTQI plus migration entitled Bodies and Borders, LGBTQI plus plus migration on, from, and to the African continent. Our second panelist, Dr. Kawani Gambela, is a senior lecturer, anthropologist, and award-winning educator at the University of Johannesburg. He teaches on medical anthropology, anthropological theory, and childhoods and youth. He is currently working on a monograph on the anthropology of boyhoods, with Duke University Press. He is a 2021 Africa Oxford Fellow with the Oxford University Research Center in the Humanities at Oxford University. And our third panelist, Tabiso Afurakan Mohare, is an aspiring poet and recording artist who has been active in the South African poetry scene since 2002. His debut short collection of poems, titled The Broken Man Chapbook, was launched in Rotterdam, Netherlands in September 2017. He is the co-founder and CEO of the Word and Sound Live Literature Company, a groundbreaking poetry development project that has been running in Johannesburg since 2010. Tabitha is also an award-winning copywriter and has two major commissions that saw him spread his writing to television with the award-winning Channel O Hip Hop Express promo and the recent ETV Gold Diggers TV series. Welcome to all of our guests and our facilitator and thank you all for watching this discussion. Uh, my name is Akani Shimange, my pronouns are they, them. Um, I run an organization called Madimba that works specifically with transgender youth in South Africa. Um, I also coordinate the African Trans Network, and I guess I do a whole lot of work around trans issues. And that's how I know B, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... I am, I am personally honored to facilitate a conversation with all three of you, um, but also I find it very important to have a conversation that cuts across sectors on masculinity, continue to see the ways in which we speak of masculinity is that it's very segregated, right? Um, we have cis men speak about masculinity, we have trans people speak about masculinity, we have women speak, and I think it's very important for those conversations to come together in order for us to actually be able to articulate what toxic masculinity is. And I think that's my starting point. Um, 
would you be able or can I ask you guys to um, define toxic masculinity? Okay, I can go. Um, I like going first because you say the most obvious <laughs> thing <laughs> and make it difficult for everyone else. For everybody else. <laughs> yeah. No, I think for me, I, I, I mean, one of the things that's been so useful, especially with uh, Black feminist scholars, is really the recognition that the problem is not necessarily all the time or always about masculinity, but it's these harmful forms of masculinity um, that, that often are, are a problem. So when you think about, when I think about toxic masculinity, you think about, you know, what, what is toxic? It's like anything that can harm but and, and ultimately kill you. And we see a lot of these incidents um, um, in South Africa of various forms of, of, of toxic masculinity in, in everyday discourse. I don't need to cite all the statistics that um, I think a lot of us know. So my understanding um, really of toxic masculinity is it, it's, it's these masculinities that uh, are not only harmful, um, but also masculinities that ultimately kill. Um, and I think about killing um, not just always in terms of physical violence, um, we often talk about um, structural violence in medical anthropology. So it's, it's all these other forms that feel um, 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 ultimately not just harm, but also death um, um, of, of, of people, including men um, themselves. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I've been really struggling with this one today because I, it seems to me it's impossible to define toxic masculinity without then talking about femininity as well. And that immediately leads me to this binary place where um, I wonder, I want to see toxic masculinity as, as structural and like linked to patriarchy and but then it, it only seems to be toxic when it comes into contact with the ways in which it wants to suppress femininity and then not, it never seems to be thought of as toxic in relation to itself, if that makes sense. So it's always about the danger that's, that's caused by masculinity externally rather than a, a seeming like responsibility of what is masculinity, what is good masculinity and what are the ways we divert from that? And that creates a problem which is linked to the structural, which creates issues for people who are femme or feminine presenting. Does that make sense? We, yeah. and we, it's, it's the ways in which we describe toxic masculinity I often feel like put it outside of the, like the, the place in which it comes from. Mm -hmm. No, so absolutely. Not a, I think not a definition, just a mess. No, uh, just to interject quickly, I think also that's one of the most interesting things in South Africa, and this is not to downplay, obviously, um, femicide or um, the kinds of toxic masculinities that harm gender and unconforming persons. But the interesting thing is that in South Africa, we know that actually men are killing more men. Um, so I think I like that point that B is making, which is to really start, you know, we're not having enough of these conversations of the ways in which masculinity or toxic masculinity in and of itself is harmful to men um, themselves. Men, um, you know, die from the most car accidents in South Africa. Um, they commit the most um, suicide, if that's a improper phrasing. Um, and, and so we know that even amongst men themselves, um, that it, 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 toxic masculinity is actually eating um, itself from the inside as well. And obviously we know that it, it, it does infiltrate um, outside of um, not just men and, and two women and gender non-confirming persons, children, and so on. Lisa? Sure, like, um, thank you. Don't make it any easier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sure, and, and, and for me, I mean, I don't have an academic background, so I, I've not had the opportunities to sort of um, study and read um, extensive research. A lot of what I come across is uh, within the daily sphere and obviously interacting with a lot of creatives. They, they tend to express themselves a lot around, especially, you know, pertinent issues. Um, and I know for the last couple of years within the poetry and literature space, we've been looking at uh, toxic masculinity, looking at patriarchy, you know, where does it start? Where does it stop? Where's the departure point? What needs to be done? Whose responsibility is it? Um, and then every now and then somebody will say, hey, but uh, who are the mothers who raise these men? And then mm -hmm. it throws, you know, <laughs> the whole conversation in, into another, another segue, you know. So which, for me, I think in simplifying what I see as toxic masculinity, 
is behavior that is devoid of femininity. It sounds very simplistic, but I think, I think from, from my experiences as a black man, femininity is always something that's external of you, you know, and femininity is not explored in a sense of as a human being, you have a hard side and a soft side or whatever the dynamics you want to call them. I mean, English is, is not, is not a very good language in describing, um, you know, some of the, 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 the internal things, you know, but we've been taught that femininity in how I understand it is external. It's weaker. It's attributed with this kind of people. Masculinity on the other hand is this, you know, it's, it's, and how it's expressed, um, it's almost like there's a guide to it. You're raised into it. Uh, you see it every day, it gets reinforced. So for me, that's why I said like, it's almost like it's, it's, it's behaviors that is devoid of the other consciousness, uh, devoid of understanding that you are both, you know, masculine and feminine inside. Um, whether you simplify to being able to cry or being able to soldier on, a human being can have both, you know, it's not a, it's not an either or, you know, but I think it's still largely um, a question I'm unpacking for myself because I'm going through a journey as a black man to say it's pointless to point it out there and try to understand it there. Is it easier if I then look at me and say, okay, what am I doing? What are the reference points I can mirror me against to start understanding this toxic toxicity? Because it's, 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 a, it's a big margin between the physical or the more um, apparent toxic toxicity, whether it's, you know, uh, catcalling, killing, raping. Uh, but then what about psychological violence? You know, what do you do to your partner in the household? You know, so for me, it's been that continuous journey of understanding this. I have been messed up for a long time. Okay. So how do I start understanding me in, in relation to, to, to what I see and understand outside? I hope that makes sense. Oh. <laughs> it does. <laughs> oh, it does. Yeah, it totally makes sense. It does. And um, I think for me, it leads to something I thought through when I read through this, right? Um, that are there forms of masculinity that are not toxic? Because continuously when you speak of masculinity, we speak of it from a place of toxicity, right? Mm -hmm. And um, my question was, what is, what is toxic masculinity? And Taviso said something that is devoid of femininity, right? So is masculinity inherently toxic? And if it is not, what parts of it do we need to basically get rid of in order for us to know what healthy masculinity is like? I, I, you know, I, I, me, I'm going to have a problem with this idea that like, in order to save masculinity, we must go and fetch femininity. That's, that's like, it puts too much work on this idea, idealized notion of like the goodness of femininity and like the ways in which it like makes me want, because we, we are creeping towards that space where it's like, you know, women are inherently good. Femininity lives there. And the only way to fix like the badness of masculinity is to go and fetch some of that because like we've, we've put it, away from ourselves i think it's also a problem with just having these two words that we can only describe like all of human experience as either femininity or masculinity um but i think that we would like ask too much of femininity to think that it must now come and rescue masculinity but, and and i agree with that i entirely agree with that and i think i think what i'd like us to explore very intentionally is which parts of masculinity do we need to discard for us to understand that masculinity can exist and not be toxic, right? And this is the work of masculinity. It is not the work of femininity. We must stop putting so much work, A, on feminine bodies, right? On women, on continuously we do this thing where men are allowed to get away with everything because there's a savior somewhere, your mother, your aunt, your cousin, the feminine man in the room. But what are the things that as people that identify as masculine, um, the three of you feel need to be discarded 
from masculinity in order for us to be able to speak of masculinity as a thing that is not inherently toxic. Yeah, that's a really good one. I mean, I often don't speak about masculinity, but um, rather speak about the plural form because it recognizes that there isn't really just one kind of masculinity and that there are plurality of masculinities. So I don't think that necessarily um, all masculinities are toxic. And I think a lot of scholars um, have written about this um, healthy, what would you know, healthy forms of masculinity look like? And I think the key thing there when we talk about toxic masculinity is that, you know, I think a healthier form of masculinity would start from the premise that first of all, you're not harming someone, you're not killing someone, um, forms of um, um, freer expression, um, accommodating of difference, and many, many other things that you, 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 you can include there. So, but I do think as a key starting point, if you're going to talk about, you know, a world without toxic masculinity, you have to think about a world without this, um, especially the hegemonic forms of masculinity that cause harm and that kill. And I think both B and Tabiso raised something really interesting, which is, you know, also, and I think especially on, on Tabiso's point, which is in South Africa, a lot of households are actually headed by women. So I think that's why also I don't like also the dichotomy or the dichotomy between, you know, the absence of feminine, because they, they are formed in relation to each other in many South African contexts. And we know that, you know, that a lot of women do do um, active socialization work. Um, with young boys, and not all of those socialization processes are necessarily less um, less harmful than what the men also are, what you know the patriarchal men would teach their sons. So I think I don't like that dichotomy that you know just because you have femininity, then necessarily that means you know it's a healthy dynamic, or that when you have masculinity, that it's always um, um, harmful. I mean, you, there's a lot of work again in in LGBTI settings and internet relationships where you do have um, these heterocentric forms of patriarchal violence still showing up, even with people who might not identify within that binary. So I think for me, I, I, when you can't talk about toxic masculinity without talking about the kinds of harms um, that it does, and I think by talking about those harms, we can start to see, okay, this is what you know, we need to, to excavate in order to be able to, to get to this healthy form. Um, of masculinity. I hope I'm making sense. <laughs> hmm, sure. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm still, maybe I'm still trying to understand for myself personally, um, you know, the departure point of the separation. Um, because I'm still like, what, what, what do we mean? Maybe, maybe you guys can also like enlighten me here. What do we mean when we say masculine? You know, is it in, 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 in a physical form, as in, you know, physical attributes? Is it in the, the energy form, you know, um, uh, because, you know, everything is energy, we are energy. Is it learned behavior? Is it an automatic behavior of a certain physical form? Because, you know, I, if, if you bring it down to, let's say, I mean, you know, boys will be boys or men will be men. So somehow now your body, your, how you use your body, how fit it is, how strong it is, um, is attributed then to, you know, masculinity and this manhood. So I'm still trying to understand for myself that is, is our departure point even, even, even relevant? Um, because for me, as a human being, before I am any gender or any orientation or, you know, as a human being, there are certain innate behaviors that I've learned as a human being um, from my surroundings, from my, my parenting, my parents and so forth. And there are certain behaviors that I've come to learn and be able to um, 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 unpack for myself and understand that this is wrong or this is harmful in such a way, right? And a lot of it, you know, going any harm that I don't want done to myself, I should be able to extend to, to extend that, um, that privilege or that to, to the next person. So, as a human being, where does masculinity start, or even femininity start, where the, 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 the real world expression of it is in the behaviors, right? Whether it's the most gruesome of behaviors or the softest of it. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm personally, I'm, I'm still stuck at that question to say, <laughs> what <Yeah>. is masculinity? <laughs> <It's> like, no, <laughs> I think that makes sense to me. Um, but I think in some ways you've actually answered it for yourself. I think it's a combination of everything that you, you, you've mentioned. I think you know, um, socialization is just one aspect of it. We know that you know. Um, I think you know the sort of clinical academic definition of masculinity would be would not actually be linked to your body its attributes um, 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 that are seen as as manly in society so for instance my research is with Amakosa and historically and a lot of people often don't know this but you know Ubu thought that manhood um, I mean among Amakosa was not linked to a body but it was linked to how you your industriousness um, are you able to you know look after the livestock are you able to plant and and so on. it was linked to um, one's industriousness rather than your 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 um, um, ascribed gender. But um, I think for me, a key starting point um, always in thinking about masculinity, and that's why I think I'm interested in the boyhood period, because one of the things that I've found, especially in, in all the interviews I've done with men, is that so much of socialization processes start in the boyhood period um, very early on. So it's all of those um, things that you learn in social context. This is what you're supposed to be doing as a girl. Or if you're a girl, then you do the dishes, you clean the house. And if you're a boy, you're looking after the livestock. And that's why you often have that um, tension with, with girls who, who are you know, doing things that are seen as for boys or girls who look after the livestock and are seen more, as more manly. Um, so I do think it's, I think it's a combination of the things that you've said. But I do think um, a key aspect of, of, of how we come to learn um, and attach ourselves to certain kinds of masculine ideals are often um, determined early on um, in childhood. It doesn't mean you can't unlearn in adulthood, but I do think that period is so foundational to how a lot of people learn. And when you think about, I'm talking too, too much, but when you think about... Um, conversations about rape culture in South Africa, we know that, you know, that there are these norms that, you know, a, a boy is supposed to persist at all costs and that if a girl rejects him, then, you know, it just means continue on and that, that, no, that, that no is not a complete sentence. All of these things are taught and are laughed at um, in childhood in a, in, a, in a lot of context. So I, I always think for me, we can't really discuss where we are with men without really looking at all of, also those um, early foundational um, periods about what boys are taught um, up, about how to behave um, socially. I think it's really interesting, you know, in, in that kind of period, as someone who was uh, socialized as a girl and kind of watched, that yeah. it was very clear to me that there are things that are ideals. Mm. Masculinity always has ideals put after it. Mm -hmm. And mm. there are no, when you're that age, there aren't things that are feminine ideals. There are things that you mm. can do which are feminine, but they're not ideal. Mm. They're kind of they're the second best. Mm. And whenever you cross over into masculine, it's completely, it's praiseworthy, right? The tomboy is like, mm. oh, you're just a girl who's really busy and runs around and like wants to climb trees. That's mm. all praiseworthy. But yeah. any other body even a girl who performs femininity really well is just seen as like, she's just being a girl. And what that means is she's just being weak. Mm. There's no, there's even at that age, there's no, I like, I, it's, if there's a feminine ideal, it's not praiseworthy. Mm. So there is something about the ways in which like, um, even from that very young age, ways in which masculinity is praised and set up as an ideal from very, very early, that these are, things that are um, uh, things that we should like uh, aim for. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, there mm. also there's the dynamic of um, almost, I think young girls who, who attribute, you know, um, sort of behavior that is seen as masculine. Then there's also the dynamic of they're almost seen as failed, like femininity. Um, so I just thinking anecdotally, like, you know, the key questions would always be like, how are you going to find a husband if you are behaving in this way? So it's always in some ways also linked to an adultificated form of how, of, of, of how the young girl will lose out on femininity if she continues to, to do that. But I completely get that. 
as well. I mean, I think, you know, a lot of, again, masculinity scholars have written a lot that almost for every boy, the worst fear, you know, is to be called a feminine term. Um, it's almost like the, the peak derogatory um, form if you, you, you express femininity um, as a sort of expected masculine body um, in society. So that I, I, I get that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, that's like, for me, that's the, mo the key beginning seed of toxicity, right? Yeah. And we ascribe it to, we want to say that it's toxic masculinity, but, and what, I think that's what I was getting at earlier. I think that the ways in which we want to describe these two things is somehow, um, you know, as a non-binary person, I find having just two difficult. And when we say that the one is going to be from the very beginning, if you're called something feminine, then it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And we're going to mm -hmm. praise the masculine. We, we, we already mm -hmm. set ourselves up to fail. Yeah. And you see the... But I also... Oh, so, sorry, Tavisa. <laughs> okay. um, but I'd also kind of like to answer Tavisa's question to, to a particular extent, right? So, um, the, like the root of your question was, is it physical, is it energy, is it performance, right? And I think what we're all discovering is that it is not physical, right? And this is, this is what we have understood, I think, for generations and the ways- But I'm trying to get strong, what do you mean? <laughs> but, it's, but it's not physical because it's not, it's not attached to a body, right? And this is why when women perform a particular thing, right? Bodies that are seen as female perform a particular thing. Immediately, they're like, you're acting in a masculine manner, right? And when we speak of toxic masculinity, it has not only existed within cis men and within cis head relationships, right? It has existed within women. And Gobani brought this up very beautifully of how there are patriarchal examples or performances within queer relationships, right? And this is how masculinity has managed to kind of um, permeate into, toxic masculinity has managed to permeate into all spaces, right? Um, and the ways in which it is even taught into those spaces is a toxic version, right? Is that mm -hmm. you must perform your masculinity as ownership of your partner, as ownership of the situation you're the provider and when you cannot provide you are failing and this continuous thing that we do as soon as anyone performs a masculinity how people will ask queer people for the same gender who's the man because we yeah. need to know who to address yeah. who must perform the messiness who's the actual important person in the situation right because the yeah. feminine one is just there for performance right and they belong to someone, and we can't talk to them until we've spoken to the superpower of the household, right? So there's a, so it's not a body, but it is attached to a very particular performance, right? Mm. It is attached to a particular energy that walks into the room and you know that they are the person, right? Mm. And that's the masculinity that is toxic, that, but also the masculinity that we're taught, and we cannot speak of, toxic masculinity and patriarchal violence without speaking about violence against black men, without speaking about the colonial history of South Africa, without speaking about how we come to the idea of what masculinity is, right? And so we must never speak about it like it is in, in a silo, but also what does it mean for us to continuously try to unpack this thing without unpacking the history but also unpacking that it has managed to permeate every part of society. Mm. I think I would criticize you a little bit there, um, Akani, because I think okay. for me, and that's why I was saying to Tabi, so that it's a combination of all, because one of the things we know, certainly in the South African context, is that actually the body is important to, to, to the performance, so certainly the to the attainment of masculinity. And when you, th when you think about not just Amakosa, but many other cultural groups, for instance, that have initiation ceremonies, um, those, in those, in fact, um, Sakum's, in fact, Professor Sakum's, in fact, and his work um, at UWC is actually about the centrality of the body in, 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 in the constitution of, of, um, of, of manhood in, 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 in initiation practicing societies. 
And one of the key things he says, he actually critiques um, um, uh, your position that, you know, because when you look at the, at, the, at the masculinity theories that are coming from the West, a lot of them talk about, you know, the social construction of masculinity, um, the, the, the performance, and so on. And he's not saying that, you know, in their context that these are wrong, but that in, South, in the South African context, the body is, in some ways, in a lot of cultural groupings, one of the most central aspects, which is why, you know, when you think about botched circumcisions and that, you know, these young boys, in some ways, are tainted for life because they'll never be able to fully um, attain that masculinity. So you can give your own critique, but I don't think in the South African context we can really separate um, the body because it's so central. I mean, one of the things that I saw earlier this year, I was so struck by it and so disturbed. There was this clip that was widely circulated on Twitter and it was this young boy. You can see in the beginning, they are in this school transport. They're coming from school. And it was this young boy and they, they, I can't remember what they were saying, but they were tormenting him. And then at some point he gets up and he's like, I'm going to cut up your balls. I'm going to feed them to this. And, but you could tell that, you know, he's learned this from somewhere that if someone is tormenting you or if someone is responding to you in a particular way, that, you know, violence is in some ways the answer. And part of it is you, you remove what is seen as the central aspect of being a man, which is, you know, your private part. So anyways, I'm going on too long, but I think, I, I, I do think that we, we, we do need to think about the centrality of the, the body, in, in, not in isolation from other factors um, such as socialization, but I do think there's something about how, especially South African men, um, we use the body in sometimes non-harmful ways, but also and in, in very, very harmful ways as a form of enacting or attaining a certain kind of masculinity. Um, so I, I hear that. Um, I think we should also be cognizant of the colonial history, right? Mm -hmm. Because that conversation is not devoid of the colonial history. The idea of gender in itself is rooted in a colonial history. And the ways in which, I love how in the beginning you said how manhood was not attributed to a body. Yeah. It was attributed to actions, right? Mm -hmm. And you're speaking about Tosa culture, and I can speak on the same within yeah. Tonga culture. We can literally go through all African cultures and we can actually find this. Yeah. There's, there's a thread that goes through around how masculinity was never given or seen or addressed because of a body, right? Yeah. Yeah. And gendering of bodies is a colonial history. Right, and so when we when we come back and we speak to how it is centered around the body, that is a colonial thing. So it is not a South African thing. It is not yeah. an African thing. But we must also admit that South Africa has a particular history of coloniality, yeah. right? And um, that means we are we we somehow see our history not further than before we were colonized. So when we speak of but masculinity, what is masculinity if it is not a body? Yeah. But who are we before that colonization, right? And mm -hmm. so I think there's, a, there's, there's more to unpack behind that mm -hmm. that um, is very important, but also um, I just remembered I am not supposed to be part of the conversation I'm facilitating it. No, come And I think, I think it's, I, but I also think there's a lot of, interestingly enough, um, I've read a lot of these work, right? And there's, there's a lot of that, what I just said, that comes from a lot of these work, right? Yeah. Um, and I'd like to ask them to speak to it, right? To speak to um, how the region speaks of masculinity how we have, there's a beautiful quote in one of these papers that says, um, a particular individual identified as a male lesbian, which throws us all off, right? But yeah. it speaks of how masculinity and maleness is not attached to our body. Uh, not to put me on the spot, right? <laughs> not intentionally. <laughs> I, I want to make one, I want to make two separate points. I think the one is that like, 
what you're pointing to is that these things have changed. And I think in this current moment, we often talk as though these things are unchanging, that they're set in concrete for time. We know more and more. And part of the problem that we currently have in South Africa, I think in particular, is the challenge to this system. The challenge to patriarchy, the challenge to toxic masculinity, which is um, led in some part, in some senses, to this kind of like backlash and wave of violence because it doesn't want, as a system, it doesn't want to be challenged. And so if we know that pre-colonialism there were particular ways, then what colonialism suggests is that these things are also changing over time. And what we're seeing now is a challenge. You know, we see, um, you know, I know a lot of Tosa trans women who don't want to go to the mountain. Like that's mm -hmm. it because if you don't go to the mountain, then you don't become a man, then you don't get masculinity. Those are things that also make sense in that equation. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's really interesting for the space in which we live, that the, mm -hmm. you can also repudiate it in a particular way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know, you know, I think that the ways in which people, for, for, for people that we call trans now, we call themselves trans now, we know we have, ex we are existing and have existed for time immemorial. We've just called ourselves different things. We, you know, when you talk about masculinity being connected to a body, there is an assumption of genitals, right? Like m most of you, if we think about like trans people at a conservative estimate are about one in 1000. So if you've met a, a redhead person in your life, you've a ginger, you've met a trans person, you just don't know it because not all of us are out there with big T's on our forehead. So that means that the ways in which people are treated, it's assumption. The boy who stands up on the bus assumes that the people he's talking to have those genitals to be able to shove down their throats in the first place. He doesn't know that as a fact, but so he's reading masculinity and treating it in a particular way, given the body that he's faced with. And those are all the things that we need to like stretch apart and think about what we ascribe to what we believe is present. Um, the, the lesbian, the male lesbian, lesbian man is a person who feels that they are a man, but also believes their sexual orientation to be a lesbian and doesn't see a conflicting, um, doesn't see that as a conflict in identity, the ways in which we've been told that we must keep these things apart because they travel in particular ways and it makes sense when you have to ask for rights doesn't always mean that it ends up being those things where people actually live out particular feelings of self and desire in the world. But I mean, that person can also experience and, um, you know, perform toxic masculinity. Um, if I can just add, you know, to that, for me, again, you know, the, 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 you know, my internal struggle lately is labels and, and, and trying to sort of redefine myself outside of given labels. And, you know, I think one of my, my challenges towards patriarchy is, is the challenge of unburdening myself. Um, and, and, and I've used that as a way of, of, you know, an active way to, one deep understand patriarchy its effects right down to then you know um uh toxic masculinity and the role that i play there what i express daily and how i i i i, I perform it and for me as a you know so-called straight black man um who sits somewhere in the hierarchy of you know the human oppression if i want to call it that um this idea of masculinity that i've inherited that that, that i've been taught you know through culture, through um, um, my parents' orientation and so forth, has burdened me with so much, you know, that I feel at a practical level, I cannot, you know, um, the time in the world that I live in does not allow me to be a breadwinner and to still be the scorpion donor guy in the house, you know, it's, 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 there, is, there is the world nowadays for me as, 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 as a black person, as a black male, as well, is so demanding that all of the promises of patriarchy, all of the the power and the uh, that comes with patriarchy, it, 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 it's 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 not realistic. And me trying to demand that power, me trying to demand that position.
from society, from people, from my partner. From, I'm, I'm setting myself further and further back, where for me there is movement in evolution, there's movement in, in fluidity, there's movement in, in saying, you know, I recognize the, the ills of that and, and I don't want to teach that to my children. Um, at least I can start there, um, at least the past that I'm conscious of. Because what I'm even noticing now with even my own daughter, you know, um, my wife and I, we agreed, you know, before she was born that we're going to buy all colors, you know, past, we're just going to go crazy. <laughs> we're just like, we're going to buy everything that looks good, you know. By the time she was born, she had everything from lime green to like, you know, deep maroon. And um, she's been going to the grandparents for the last couple of months. And there's so many pink things like in her, in her wardrobe now. Like it's difficult to just dress her without just all it being like different shades of pink. And, you know, had a, a soft approach with my mother. She's like, no, 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 no. You're trying to raise a boy. This is a girl. And, and so I, I felt defeated. This is a fight <laughs> to go back into, you know. So I think that was, for me, it's, it's, it, the, the personal realization is that, you know, patriarchy is not sustainable um, for, 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 for at least the black man going forward, uh, especially in South Africa, especially within our context. Um, because then if we keep that position, it sabotages us even to the, in the mundane of things, you know, even in, in, our, in our households, even in, in the capacities that we, we bring to a relationship as partners, you know. Um, yeah. It adds stress to that, where you're not able to accept different capacities to sit in different spaces. And, you know, so I just don't think it's sustainable. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm beyond just, you know, rebelling and rejecting patriarchy, but I'm using that as a way to start checking also my own behaviors and to say, how do I start creating a set of values, a set of behaviors that can become at least my family's system of values or rules going forward. Because I want to free my daughter. Mm. You know, um, I want my daughter to know that she is a human being who can do, she can, you know, she can be whatever she wants to be. She can be weak, she can be soft, she can be hard, she can be strong. She, you know, how do I teach that practically without just, you know, just theory, without her having to wait until she's in school to read about it? Um, um, because if I don't actively play a part, um, you're right, patriarchy um, is, 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 is fighting back so much, it's fighting back so hard, you know, that, that it's, 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 it's even twisted, you know, the whole thing of half-truths save enough time to come the truth. We, are, we end up being, even with our heads on and in the right mind frame, we end up perpetuating a lot of that behavior um, mm -hmm. because we are not super conscious. But you know, I don't know, I, like, um, as a, this is a tangent, but as, like, a, as a trans person in the world at the moment, it's really difficult, and I've been figuring out how I, like, what are my tools for survival, and my partner's been very helpful in um, talking and showing me stuff about freedom dreaming, and, and I watched something yesterday with Gary Young and Lula Olafemi, who, he, they were saying in the moment, you know, we keep saying as though we're going to change things in the future, but the small things that we're doing now are already making the spaces. And then they were talking about um, uh, prison abolition and how we've been talking about it for 90 years, but now suddenly, you know, there's an older generation of activists who have been talking about it and everyone said, oh, this is a joke, but now we really see a heavier conversation happening. And I think about like your daughter's wardrobe in the same way. Like, when I look back, I remember the one time my dad bought me a pair of purple dungarees and I was made to wear dresses every day. And this was the one item that said, okay, maybe my dad sees me. And it's been like a key conversation point for us, for him to understand me. And in part, I, I think of that as like a small part of a freedom dream for me. And I imagine that like just having the option for your daughter is like the next step in undoing the kind of, structure of like that patriarchy feeds on right to say these are the only things you can have and these are tied to particular ways of being and those are the only ways you can be and I, I think that like the point is not to and this is maybe the point with toxic masculinity as well is not to just throw throw it all out like we're not going to get rid of masculinity we can keep the pink in the cupboard but we can have like lime green as well 
There's a Buddhist saying um, that uh, start where you are. So I think I completely get everything Tabuso is saying. Like, I, I think there's so much you can control within your own sphere. But then once kids move out, they, there's the schooling system, there are other uh, grandparents and so many other spheres in, at which we, we, we are socialized. But I like what B is saying as well, that you know, often kids will, will not forget um, those little plantings earlier on. And we know that parents are some of the um, uh, most important agents in the socialization of children. So even when they do go to school, um, they would have had that exposure um, 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 to some of the things that you, you, you expose them to. So you, you can only ever start where you are. And I think that's you're doing good. There's an interesting... Um, well, I'm waiting for the book, um, but I, I watched the, the, the short documentary. It's called, I think, The Conspiracy to Destroy the Black Boy Child. So something, I can't remember the name exactly, but it's a, a, a black American um, professor um, uh, with an African name. Like I ordered the book. I'm, I'm waiting for it. But I, so I watched that 30-minute doc, and I was like, yes, yes, I got to read. I want to, I wanna, I wanna, you know, um, get more into it. But... So he's been throughout his life looking at significant influences on young black men um, in different forms, in education, in society, in different settings. And one of the interesting things that I found in the, the, the docu was around um, sort of the presence or the absence of male teachers at specific grades um, in, a, in a child's development. Because then, what I think the department that found that between, I think, up until age eight or nine, young black men were fine, you know, they, they, would, they had all range of emotions and all range of, of behaviors, but then after a particular grade, you know, then suddenly um, there would be like a massive switch, you know, so as they did further studies and um, started unpacking, I think they found that um, between grade one and three, in most of the schools, there isn't positive uh, male influence um, 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 that these you know young black kids are exposed to, and they were sort of looking at if that does then affect uh, because then it says at thirteen, for example, when it comes to sex education, your child has already started having sex, and then now you want to come to what the bees and the birds. So mm -hmm. if there isn't positive black role models or male role models for those black kids, trying to intervene when they are thirteen with uh, positive role models might be a little bit, a little bit, um, a little bit too late, you know. So I think I think. I like the idea of not throwing out everything, um, but I think for me the greater challenge is then that how do I prepare? Because I can't control what's out there, I can't control a lot of the influences she might experience outside, you know. But how, as a parent um, and as a well, trying to free think uh, um, uh, um, human being, prepare her or give her the tools at least to better respond or to have a better position, a sense of herself and 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 um her sense of being so that whatever the world throws at at her or whatever uh pronoun she might want to use going forward um she has the skills and the tools to 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 you know to stand her own at least to, to deal with with the world so Sabisa, i think um i think parents don't give themselves like the i don't know like the pat on the back that they actually deserve, right? Or the non-pat on the back that they actually deserve. Because when things <laughs> go wrong, they're like, oh, it was the school teachers. When things go right, they're like, oh, it was us, right? Um, and I think as a trans person, I will personally say, I think so much of my influence is what came from my household, right? Because what we all understand is that the world is not built for us. The world is not built for queer people. The world is not built for black people. The world is not built for trans people. The world is not built for alternative versions of masculinity that are not toxic. The world. So, but what our parents have managed to do is to create these safe havens that I come home and I'm like, you know what, whoever bullied me and my mother says to me, you're right, you were bullied, mm. right? She doesn't say to me, go back and kick his ass. Right, she says, you were bullied and you're right and I see you and that is valuable, right? And, and the thing that B brought up, the thing that Kobani was bringing up, that like at the end of the day, we don't remember, we all, 
I think we can all sit in a room and say I was bullied at some point. We don't really know much about those bullies, right? But we remember what our parents said to us after those bullies bullied us, right? And so there isn't much you can do. You can't, you can't shift the world. But what you can do is that she wakes up in a household that says, I see you and whoever you want to become in the world. When the world says no, come back here and become that person. Right? So beyond that, you can't do much. You can't you can buy as many lime outfits. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can buy as, as many lime outfits as possible. You can, um, but you don't know the power of your affirmation that you have. And, and I think this is, this is the thing our parents don't understand and how masculinities are even built within us, right? That when we continue to speak of like how father figures could have, should have, right? is that so much of the ways in which we perform masculinity was taught within a household. Mm. We could have had the most brilliant teachers in the world, right? But when I went home, if I was told that I am a sissy mm. because I did not beat up the guy that bullied me, I'll go back and beat him up even if it means I get detention. The teacher said I must not mm. beat him up, but my father said, right? Yeah. And so... Our masculinity, the ways in which we perform in the world, is built and performed and created within a household. Mm -hmm. And we perform it then for the world, right? And if I think, I genuinely believe if we could get people and households to understand that, that mm -hmm. when your child does this, you have so much power over that, right? Mm -hmm. So much could change how we interact with the world outside. Yes. And it has huge implications. Um, um, I know certainly from um, studying men's health. And there's this graph that I often show when I do workshops with young boys. Um, and it's by the World Health Organization. And it's around the, it's, it's grouped by age. So um, from, you know, birth to about 10 years and then 10 years to about 15 and so on. And it goes up until the 40s. And it looks at um, the trajectory of both um, of, of, of girls and boys in terms of suicide rates. And what they found, it links to what Tabiso was saying, is that between the age of, you know, from birth till about 10 years, there isn't a significant difference in, in the behavior of boys and, and, and girls in, in, in how, in, at the rate of suicide. But something changes from the age of 11 till 13 or so you start to see the numbers double for boys. And the older they get, like the numbers up until like, it's like three times, I think the rate um, at which, you know, men commit suicide, I think at three times the rate of, 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 of women. And part of, it's not the only explanation, but part of it, what you can see from that graph is really the, that, you know, what, what are the kinds of socializations that girls receive at that particular age? Obviously there's diversity. But we know that it's around the time that, as Akan was saying, that, you know, boys are expected to toughen up, that they're not supposed to tell. If you were bullied at, at school, then you fight back rather than, you know, you, know you, you can't even express that you are scared. So we know that all of these ideas actually not just, um, um, not just, um, are, are, are just things that are internalized, but that they often literally affect um, the health of men um, um, in, in the long run because they are not then able to seek help. They're not able to express emotions because of what they, they are taught, especially in the teenage years. Um, so we know that um, um, a, a, a home environment that is conducive to sharing issues around bullying and so on often goes a long way um, in terms of supporting not just girls, but also boys um, as well. But are we yeah. saying then, just as a you know, question, were none of us those bullies? I was never a bully. No, I, was I, I, <laughs> I was bully. No, I'm saying because there's, there's different yeah. versions of masculinity here. There's no, a lot of sure, aspiration sure. at that age. Many yeah, of us are working yeah. out things. And yeah. I, yeah. I see us swinging towards, you know, this is what boys do. This is what girls yeah. do. And I'm wondering, yeah. again, where is, what is our responsibility? Yes. Yeah. I think I was probably a bully. I think, I think, <laughs> I can, I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> You don't no, know what you are, <laughs> until somebody can show you a mirror. You know, it's usually hindsight. You know, and 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 I, and I think for, so. 
for example, um, when, when, when I talk to other men, when we deal, for example, primarily with sexual violence um, by men, and uh, there's, a, there's a, a little line that we like to bring up called, let me finish. And a lot of men were like, what do you mean, let me finish? And that's the one statement that literally takes them to their boyhood through, you know, whenever they started having sex, right up into like tertiary, you know, when you say to, to, to a guy that at some stage, if a girl has ever said to you, stop, and you said, can I finish? You have raped, or you probably have raped. And then suddenly you just literally see their eyeballs just roll to the back of their heads. Because then they are going back into, you know, their high school behavior, into their university behavior, and really, really checking themselves. Because at that time, nobody, you know, was big flashlights going, you know, yeah. that is rape. That is, you know, for them it was like, but, you, yeah, it's, 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 it's been such, a, such an am amazing learning. So I hope I was probably a bully. You know, I probably have said some... Some things I probably reacted in, um, 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 in certain ways, and I'll have to go back and 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 and, and, and dig deep if I really want to to do this, you know, because um, because patriarchy and thing, I mean, it's heavy. Like I don't. That's why young kids, like young boys, commit suicide because the burden of it and the role mm -hmm. you have to perform to to meet the standard of man, the standard of you know, it's 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 ridiculous. It's it's, un, it's not realistic. Yeah, but it's also, let's not it's, like, it's nice at the same time. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> it tastes yes. really like, and this is what, I mean, I see this happening all the time for, for particularly, and, you know, it's a touchy subject, but trans men go straight down that path of like, I'm now a patriarch, I'm the boss of the household, or oh, like, and mm. like, I must get praise and all these other things. And, we try and deal with it in community, but like, it's also a problem. And we, what this tells us is that patriarchy, it tastes nice it's when nice. it's working for us. Mm. So what I think that the issue then there is that we, we, we tell, I think people struggle to make the connection between the enjoyment of the position and the requirements yeah. that are unfeasible and unattainable that come with it. That mm. the two are connected to each other. So you can't just keep like eating dessert and not expect results. Mm. <laughs> and yes, I agree. I agree with B. Um, we must like, we can't be blind to the idea that, and the knowledge that patriarchy is nice. Like you walk into a room, inherently you're the most important person in a room because you look a particular way, right? You're, you're, you're the, the giver of knowledge. You know nothing about the subject, but will listen to you, right? And so I hear, Teresa, I hear the burden, right? But we must also be very cognizant of the fact that there are people who are born into the world and have to continuously prove themselves. So there's a burden of proving themselves because they do not inherently get patriarchal privilege and male privilege, right? And at the same time, are never seen, right? Mm -hmm. So it's hard. I think it's hard for people in the world that were not inherently born into a space that says, you are it, to see patriarchy as mercy and as a burden. Like if, 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 if they had a choice, it would be weight. Actually, it's, it's cool to live up to a thing because I also get like the privilege of that thing, right? Even when I'm not living up to it, even when men are mercy, even when men are not providers, even when men are not proclaimers, I don't know what patriarchy requires men to do, but that, those things, even when they're not doing those things, they are still, people praise them for just being men, for walking into a room, that you have blessed us with your presence and your existence in the world, right? And so I think we must, we, we must never just fall into the pity party of how difficult it is to be men. No, no look, without falling into the pity party, and I'll tell you why, I like what B said that, that you can't just keep eating um, uh, dessert and the dessert. results will come. Because for me, <laughs> And, and, and then, look, maybe I'm simplifying it too much, right? The, the expectations that, for example, a, a hip-hop superstar, rap star, 
sets up for 16 year olds as this performative sense of being a man, masculinity, um, and all of the trimmings that come with that, right? If, if, if that is reinforced to a 16 year old and they're in a male body, yes, they will see the, you know, the privilege. Once they start acting out, they will see the privileges of it, you know, 16, 17. But when real life starts kicking in, when you start to see that the world around you, because also the world is not fixed, the world is not 100% um, um, geared towards masculinity anymore uh, or towards patriarchy anymore, you know, there, there is massive pockets that are changing, whether it's within corporate spaces and opportunities and things that are available right down to your ability to self-sustain as a human being before a partner, before, before anybody else. You know, I think from my experience, the, the, the life is getting harder and harder and, and, and patriarchy. If you carry those principles, when you start becoming an adult, a responsible adult with certain things, you go into depression, you go and commit suicide because you are struggling to reconcile the reality of what is happening and what you are able to do against this notion of what is automatically supposed to be handed to you or should be very easy. Or you watched your father do the same thing and it was easy for, for your father, but now you, you can't do it. So, you know, down the line, the effects do kick in that the world is, is, is not stagnant and just waiting for you to come play your masculinity. And you, you know what I mean? And that's what I'm saying. If, we, we don't check and, 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 and start seeing the burden of, 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 of patriarchy, even within the joint very early. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a can we're kicking down the road. It's a noose that's going to hang us eventually. Um, you know what I mean? Because at an emotional level, human beings don't operate like that. Human beings don't want to gain um, off the oppression of others. That's not our innate nature. It's things that we are taught, you know, and that wears away at your spirit eventually. Um, everybody wants to... I, maybe I'm being too philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're making sense. I mean, yeah, my, sense. some of the things I've been writing through at the moment was, have been, um, just did a paper on, on possa masculinities in conditions of structural violence and, and, and chronic unemployment. So there are certain areas in the Eastern Cape, for instance, the part that I did my research in where unemployment is, it's, it's at over 90%. It's actually a national crisis municipality. So I've been also thinking a lot about, you know, what does it then mean um, to, to be masculine when you really have none of the things that, you know, you need to be able to climb up and to fulfill all of these duties um, that are often expected of men. And so we do know that, um, I mean, it's very similar to conversations around white privilege because there is certainly a patriarchal dividend um, I can walk outside as a, as a masculine presenting body and really not worry about being kept called and, and so on. So even though, um, um, however I see myself, but there, is, there are certain benefits um, to, to patriarchy, whether you, 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 know, you, you choose them or you don't choose them. But I do think that um, what um, Tabiso is saying is also quite important in the South African context because class does often structure um, how one experiences, and I think, you know, both um, Akami and B would probably have read um, in the literature on LGBTI, you know, that the people who have it the most terrible in South Africa are often um, black, lesbian, women, or, or gender non-conforming persons who live in townships and so on, and we know that the people who benefited the most, for instance, from, from the um, um, Civil Union Act have been predominantly white men, um, white gay men. So there, there are, um, I think, what I'm trying to get at is, is that also a class dynamic to the experience, not just of masculinity, but um, yeah, well, the experience of masculinity um, in South Africa. And often we do know that it does cause um, various forms of um, depression with men as, as soon as the older they get and you're dealing with chronic unemployment, you're dealing with, you know, um, um, to being dependent on a government grant and, and all of these issues um, affect um, um, men's ability to live up to certain kinds of ideals. Maybe I'm callous, but I'm just like, Shem, so what? <laughs> like, pull it the fuck yeah. together. Yeah. Like, women are out there, trans people are out there, non-binary people are out mm. there. Depending on your class, the struggle is real. Depending on your skin color, the struggle is mm. real. The fact that, mm. like, men commit suicide because, you know, Shem, it's harder. And, like, I yeah. can't, I, I can't accept that. Yeah. Like, it, men are 
actually physically creating violence on other people's bodies. The rest of us are out here experiencing those things and trying to survive men. Mm. Like there's no, there's no two ways about that for me. And the longer we have this conversation about like shem, men, suicide, the more mm. I just want to be like, come on, please. Yeah. No, I mean, I, w- I, w- I would accept that. I would accept that. Um, I, I, was trying, I was trying not to be the person who facilitates the conversation and says what he said, right? Um, so I, I, I worry about this idea when, um, so obviously, cis white men lead this conversation, right? But like, we cannot have the conversation of how difficult it is to be a black man, right? Without being very cognizant of the fact that if we were actually to look at it, being a black man is easier, so much easier than being a black woman, than being a queer person, than being, than being a black trans woman sex worker who lives in a village, right? And then we want to sit here and go, oh my gosh, they're unemployed. If we looked at the unemployment rate of trans people, right? which is possibly four times what it is for any other general population, right? So, like, it's hard for me to feel sorry for men as a whole, like all men, (laughs) trans men, cis men, men as a whole, as a group, right? I feel like there's a, there's a very particular, and, and it's rooted in privilege, right? There's a particular pity party we throw for them, which is based on privilege, right? Mm. Because when you are inherently supposed to have it and you don't, we're like, oh my gosh, shame. But the rest of us are not supposed to have it. So it's fine when you don't have it. Like, what were you expecting? In fact, we're shocked when you do, right? Mm. So I think there's a, there's a very intentional conversation that, Men should sit in a corner and have with each other that like perhaps we have we have it good here. Mm. Right? And how do we leverage that good? Right? Without us continuously feeling like even those who whose glass ceiling is so much lower than ours must somehow figure out how to make it happen for us. Mm. Can I can I just say that <laughs> that it is only good because we are, we are told that it's good. And the world is constructed to be good under patriarchy. Um, I think, and, 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 and that's why I, like, I, I agree with B that, you know, and, and everybody, like, we, we can't be throwing a pity party for men because in the greater scheme of things, being a man, um, especially if you're straight, kudos for you. If you're white, even better, you are what everybody wants to be, or at least what every single black man has been taught to aspire to. I think for me, what um, sort of, you know, takes me back to, 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 to where I want to do work is that even the ability to have this conversation, the ability to use this language, um, to start unpacking, is something that I have not seen my, say, cousins who are 10, 11, 12, 13, in their settings, even in their own home state, without my intervention, being able to access for themselves or through their parents or even through other, other forms of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of information, you know. So they are not having these critical dis- uh, conversations with the language and understanding of their own harm, their own inherited harm, the, the positions that they hold um, and made very conscious of it so that when they start becoming active citizens, people with um, social influence, that that is something you know that, that that whether that fails in the household and so forth. So that's what I'm I'm, I'm sort of um, trying to reconcile that it's only good because it's unfair, and that's what men need to see that it's good for you because it's unfair for the rest of everybody else. That's why it's good for you. And how do you know? Part of giving up power is is is. Is 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 but it says it's in Kulang Sang says in Kulang says in Tulamorano in Sitwana. But it's in you know, and it speaks of being able to 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 don't mean like for God, man. Uh you know there's no way for Fitola. You know, English says take off, but okay. take off is not so the right that, <laughs> No, so the the <laughs> translation because there's a Tana version. Um Leshin Alakshinu Rulanzwan. 
Um, what refuses me, this is a direct translation, <laughs> what refuses me and burdens me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, but you know, even that loose translation doesn't carry exactly what we try to say. You know, I think for me, uh, and maybe it's maybe my dream space or my head space, you know, is that whatever the fundamental um, influential point is for any, any child, and, and, and not even just for the boy child, um, I think the boy child specifically because of the role that they automatically born into what they inherit um, 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 when they work into it. But it's almost like instead of learning, they need, the first program should be unlearning because you are you're literally plugging into a program that's already preset. So how do we unplug your brain from that? Because if, if we continue at this rate, and I feel that unconscious and waiting and only being able to access these kinds of information and spaces and privilege only later in life, um, the damage that we had done up until then um, where do we write that off to, you know, on whose account do we put that? Um, because I've also seen a lot of men struggle to reconcile um, the actions of the past with who they're trying to be now, you know, and that's their own personal struggles. But I think for me, my ideal world would be, you know, what, what is that beginning point where, because again, yeah, there's no better of saying it. It's only, it only benefits us because it's unfair for everybody else. You know, and, and, and that is not a natural state of things. That is not a sustainable. And, and, and we perpetuate it because it doesn't hurt us to dismantle, right? Um, it doesn't cost us financially. It doesn't cost us physically. It doesn't cost us. It, there is still no big incentive for us grown men, you know, to, to be pushing for this outside of small pockets. Um, but we have said it does cost you, though. But you, you don't want to, you don't seem to want to, like men don't seem to want to make the connection. The pressures yeah. and trying to live up to it and the eventual suicide are because you want to live in the benefits of patriarchy. Well, the payoff is then that you have to do particular performances that are almost impossible. And so mm -hmm. the like, it's, it's, it seems like the, the like nastiness of the system is really problematic but the it's not and i think this is one of the dupes of uh, masculinity and and patriarchy is that the the two are never connected to each other the life in which you live which allows you to be the first person in the room to be taken given attention to is the same reason that you are expected to be the breadwinner and provide for an entire family and then also be whatever you said skopskin and donor in the house or whatever like those those things are connected so you can't have one without the other Um, on that note, <laughs> so um, like how, how do we start? Because and, and I think that's for me the closing question, right? So, like, what parts of masculinity? And I, I asked this in the middle, and no one answered it because, wow, well, you guys don't care about me. But, <laughs> like, <laughs> um, what parts of masculinity do we need to discard for us to? because I refuse to believe that the only versions of masculinity that exist are toxic, right? Um, I know very healthy versions of masculinity. I know very beautiful masculine humans who walk through the world very gently yeah. and very tenderly. But what parts of masculinity do we need to discard for that masculinity, the good masculinity, right? The beautiful masculinity, the one that embraces spaces, that, that is tender, that is gentle, that holds space. Um, what do we need to discard in order for us to, for our next conversations to be about that masculinity? Because, well, this toxic masculinity conversation continues to happen and we don't seem to be getting anywhere in the world with it, right? And I think also like they, they might not be an answer because I don't think we, we sit here with get rid of ABC, right? But where do we start according to everyone? I think for me, I'm not going to answer it directly, but I do think it has to be comprehensive um, because there's only so much, even in the home, like I said, um, because the kid will go to school, they'll likely use public transport at some point. Um, so there's so many other spheres of influence. So it can't just be, but also I think because masculinities are always changing and people in one day, someone can move between multiple masculinities. So for instance, at home, you might um, enact a certain kind of masculinity 
There's another one that re is required at the workplace, um, socially. Um, so people are always moving. Um, it's, not, it's not ever static. So I think for me, whatever response we have, um, it can't just be, you know, tick or cross, but it has to be comprehensive enough that, you know, um, Tabiso's child um, gets the same consistent message at school that's welcoming of her, you know, wearing a different dress or choosing a, whatever pronoun that they want to be addressed at. And they have to be supportive peers um, who are also being taught this, um, um, in their own home. So it can't just be um, one thing. I think it has to be um, comprehensive and include not just the home, but the schooling system, um, the social context, and, 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 and so many other spheres. And um, television is one of the most um, important as, um, forms of socialization. So also what, what are kids seeing when they turn on the television? Um, so I think it, it, it has to be comprehensive. I don't have a really specific answer, but that's one thing that I'm learning in my work. That it, 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 you really have to plant almost everywhere um, 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 these issues of, you know, um, children's books, cartoons, and so on. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, me, I wanted, like, I have a real problem with this dichotomy that we've set up and we keep, the problem is for me is we keep investing one with power and one without power and, and femininity only has power when it survives. We, we, you know, I look at trans women and trans femmes and it's like really, it's powerful because they're surviving in a world they're not supposed to survive in. And that for me is deeply problematic. I just, I don't want us to be, there shouldn't be like a positive to be described as masculine and a negative to be described as, as feminine. Kids should wear what they want. People should behave and express how they want. And hopefully we get to a place of like common ground. This idea that like we ascribe something, something, and therefore it has more power for me is like the, the basis of the issue. Yeah. I want a comprehensive change, but I also want more, more words, more language that indicate positive things about the ways that we are that are not just invested in masculinity as a site of power. Preach on. I mean, like, you, you can have my two minutes as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have no answers. I have more questions. I came here with a lot of questions uh, and I have even more questions. Um, and I think maybe my, 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 the one question I'm going to take and, 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 and ponder on a little bit more is also that around toxic masculinity, when it causes human harm, what is the recourse? Because we know in some instances, there's, you know, there's a law, there's laws that uh, provide recourse, but um, I'm gonna go back and look at, are we, adequately punishing um, toxic masculinity in society? Um, and if so, why has nothing changed? If not, do we need to? Because... Or is punishment the way to go? <sighs> because uh, for, for me, the bare question is like, you know, human beings, getting human beings, human beings don't have an on and off button, you know? Unless if we, in an ideal world, shut down the country, Scrap everything, write new everything, and the first human being born. This is your influence, your significant influence. This is, you know, what you shall learn going forward. Nothing else. Short of that, um, I think there has to be a carrot and a stick. I think, I think society has to be, um, you know, educated on why a more equal and more inclusive, a fairer world is important. For everybody, for everybody who lives in the world, um, and how what we thought we know is not is not real. It's it's it's, it's you know a large part of it is, is not real. Um, but I think you know sometimes enlightening a whole masses takes takes a while. But I think there has to be a carrot and a stick um, because we've seen, we see, and we continue to see every single day like serious serious forms of toxic masculinity. Um, you know that cost lives that that and when those don't go go unpunished it further reinforces um 
I, I believe, you know, that, that notion that as a man, I'm untouchable or, you know, if it's um, crimes against women or harm against uh, women or other, um, what's considered, you know, then I'm going to get punished. So, yeah, I think for me, I'm, I'm, yeah, look, look, also we are growing up here, you know, you, you have an ID, you're an adult, you commit a crime, go to jail, <laughs> you know, let's not discuss it, let's not talk about it. And then we'll, we'll teach your kids. Maybe your kids will be better. <laughs> okay. So what we take from that is that <laughs> it should be comprehensive. It shouldn't be a binary between femininity and masculinity. And Tavisa says, let's just send people to jail. <laughs> Which, okay. Not a fan of, considering I'm not a fan of the criminal system. Um, but that's a different conversation. That's a whole different conversation, right? Evolution is a whole different, different, different conversation, right? Um, but I am genuinely grateful to have had a conversation with all three of you. You have such beautiful minds. The plan was to ask you questions. My questions are still sitting on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think there was, a, there was a lot to take home from that conversation, but also I feel like it's the beginning of a conversation and this is not a conversation you have for an hour um, or 45 minutes or whatever. Well, um, also, it's not a conversation, like, Akani and I live together, by the way. But it's not, it's uh, not this is not a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> There's, no, but this is not a conversation we often have outside of like trans non-binary community spaces. And I'm sure that I I'm guessing, correct me if I'm wrong, the two of you, this is, this is a different kind of way to have or a different space to have this conversation. And this has been really interesting for me. True, true. I'm, I'm also true. grateful. I think, I think thank you for, for, for also entertaining my, my, my curiosity and also my, my, my uh my learning you know um and you're right in the sense that i personally i do have a lot of conversations you know a lot of them evolve around race racism discrimination you know but in in those particular forms of them and so forth you know um so i always feel um super privileged to be to you know to get into spaces and have these kind of conversations around um masculinity as well whereas a lot of the time i'm, I'm always the man like, oh, no, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> my brothers and sisters, oh, you know, like, <laughs> so, so, so it's, it's, for me, it's good to come into a space with questions um, um, and, and also to test my own, my own biases, my own prejudice, my own nonsense as well. Because um, as I said, Ayla, for me, this is an active, it's an conscious and active um, form of learning um, because I believe even within my own lineage, you know, um, I, I can mark a particular starting point going forward um that 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 is you know devoid of uh, we see the problems in our families we see a lot of uh the toxic behaviors within our own families so and as somebody who is the firstborn son i hold some kind of leverage within the family in terms of having a voice um and and i have you know siblings and their kids coming up so my significant influence on them or my influence on them is, is you know, I can't ignore it. And the more I am aware of the world I live in and the more, um, you know, conscious I am, I think the better influence I will be on those around me. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Avery. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I think Tabiso has captured it. Captured it. I, this is my work for me, but um, it's always good to, to have these dialogues. And I do hope that, you know, someone, whoever is watching um, at whatever time, that they do get something um, from it around, you know, how do we move forward or how do we think about toxic masculinities um, and move towards a world where, you know, like you said, um, Akani, that we don't have to be having these conversations and our conversations are around how to become more loving and accepting and so on. So, yes, thank you. I also thanked Yvonne for bringing together this panel. I thought it was interesting for me. Um, I had read, heard, um, maybe, <laughs> of the two of you. And I know this one. 
<laughs> and so I, I'm very grateful to have been in conversation um, with you, but also I think for me it's always important for us to speak of things not in the pockets that we exist in, in the world. Yeah. Right? So I, me and B will speak about trans masculinity within trans spaces or masculinity within queer spaces. Um, but it's very rare where we get this intersection of where you speak of masculinity and it has nothing to do with the fact that you're trans or cis or where you exist or if you're queer or if you're heterosexual. There's always been those barriers and I think this conversation with you was very important.